Please remain standing in body or spirit for the reading of the gospel. I'm reading from John 14, 6 through 10. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do, not, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me? Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. The Lord is in his holy temple. Won't you pray with me? God of grace, God of mercy, God of love. We give you thanks, O oh God, on this morning, rainy and wet though it is, for the ways that you meet us in the most surprising ways, if only we know how to listen for you. God, we ask on this morning, wet though it is, God, that the wetness falling from the sky would nourish our souls, that it would prepare our hearts to hear from you so that what is spoken through this humble preacher is not about what he has to say, but about what you have to say to your people. Tuck me, O oh Lord, behind your cross so that your people may hear from you clearly. We ask all of these things humbly in the name of your son, Jesus, and all together God's people said, Amen. Good morning. It is good to be here back at Calvary on this rainy spring Sunday morning. Not your typical Colorado spring so far, huh? But it is always good to be here with you all at Calvary Baptist Church. As always, I want to give thanks to my friend, uh, the Reverend Ann Scalfaro, who I know is away on a civil rights trip and to the entire ministerial and administrative staff that made my visit uh, today possible. Thanks as always to my friend uh, David who does such a fantastic job of making me feel at home every time that I come here uh, and then blesses us in song. I was gonna sing that song with David this morning but I didn't wanna show him up. I figured it would be <laughs> not good form for a visitor to do something like that. So um, I'm really excited about this sermon series that you all have entrusted me with opening. I think it's a really powerful idea to look at the 12 that Jesus called to follow him and to ask ourselves, where are we in there? My charge at the outset of this sermon series is to call our attention to what we might learn about faith and about ourselves if we focus on the Apostle Philip. As we come to this morning's sermonic moment, I want to invite you to look again with me at this morning's passage of scripture from the 14th chapter of John's gospel. No need to stand. I just want to reiterate a little bit of what has already been read for us, calling special attention to the words of Philip and to Jesus' response to Philip. Jesus, of course, is answering Thomas here as we uh, find his words at the beginning of verse 6 where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Never heard that one before, I'm sure. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. This is Jesus. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. But Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, 
Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Beloved, having prayed together and read scripture together, I invite you to meditate with me on the theme, the fruit of faithful failure. Can I get you to say that with me one time on this rainy Sunday morning? The fruit of faithful failure. It feels a little bit more Baptist in here, right? A little bit more Baptist now, right? Just from that, right? Let's see how far we can get that this morning. Why didn't Philip just shut up? I mean, what was he thinking? Who asked that kind of question to Jesus when he's been teaching, leading, and healing for so long? What's wrong with him? I could imagine some of the onlookers asking these types of questions after Philip interrupted Jesus to ask him to see the Father. Can I paint the picture for us? Here in John 14, as Jesus nears his time on the cross, he and his disciples have been together for a good while, and Philip in particular is a seasoned follower of Jesus. According to the gospel narrative, Philip is among the first handful of followers called by Jesus to transform life as they'd known it, to follow him into God's future. And by the time we arrive at this moment, this moment in John 14, Philip has witnessed more than most. He's witnessed plain water turn to celebratory wine. He's seen social categories reshaped in the name of God's plan. He's watched the lame rise and walk, and he's seen thousands fed with what he himself thought was too little. Philip has watched Jesus walk on water. He sat at the Lord's feet and soaked in the transfiguring teachings about the kingdom of God. According to John chapter 6 and beyond, Philip was among those who stayed even when many disciples deserted Jesus. Philip has watched Jesus risk his life in public, debating Pharisees. He's watched the blind receive sight. Philip has even witnessed the dead raised by the power of Christ. He has a seasoned walk with Jesus. Philip knows the Lord, we might say at my church. Yet here in our passage, we witness Philip, this seasoned saint, asking a question that might offend the religious sensibilities of many church folk who would rather pretend to be holy than to be seen as those who bear questions, doubts, and even fears regarding this thing we call Christian faith. You see, when we look back at Philip through the centuries of Christian faith that stand between him and us, much of uh, what has been uh, dragged through the context of history, uh, much of what has mischaracterized the teachings of Jesus, make it hard for us to see just what Philip can teach us here. As a signpost of how much the church has changed since Philip's time, we might recall that when Christopher Columbus and his company of Iberian Christians arrived, that is, they got lost and found themselves here in this land, instead of practicing the art of asking faithful questions, they did something else. They asserted that they were possessors of God's truth and that what they possessed entitled them to rule over others in the name of God. This is how they handled our faith. This is how they uh, misconfigured our faith. This is what happened to our faith such that when we look back at Philip, he just seems strange. Those Christians could never view Philip as being instructive because Philip's questions are tucked inside of a humility born of being close to Jesus. In Philip, there is no need for domination. There is no need for the assertion of superiority. We find simply a broken but sincere desire to see God. Here's the thing about Philip. Philip is not pretending to be a Christ follower. He's not simply using Christian identity to justify himself or what he wants. In fact, Scripture teaches us that Philip is the kind of Christian 
who's all about community and connecting folk. He is, after all, the one who brings the Greeks, that is the non-Jews, to Jesus and says, these folk want to see you. Philip is the Bible study student who's never afraid to ask that silly sounding question. He's the team member who wants to know what steps need to be taken in order for the project to succeed. Philip is the dinner party member who arrives on time and then gives side eye to everybody who's late. Philip regularly speaks what he thinks and feels, even when doing, shows, doing so shows th that he has a failed understanding, a flawed understanding of what Jesus is all about. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, Reverend Ben, you're being a little hard on Philip associating his question here with failure. But, but we should remember that one of the most precious gifts of our faith is that God finds, calls, and heals us not from our highest moments of perceived goodness, but from brokenness, failure, and sin. Ah, it's hard to see and remember that when we've got to look back through centuries of Christianity that has justified itself by saying we are right because of what we believe. But in Philip, we are reminded that God meets us not when we are sure about what we believe, but when we have questions. Why is my healing taking so long? Why is the rent so high and the income so low? If God is good, why are our babies afraid to go to school? Philip is a reminder that we meet God most clearly and most squarely, not when we have the answers and we feel secure in our power, but when we stand afraid and fear with questions that we cannot answer for ourselves. Philip can remind us that we can see and hear God's will for our lives most clearly, not when we're strongest and most clear about what comes next, but when our strength has waned and we see the future through murky glass. Here in John 14, Philip has failed to grasp the meaning of Jesus' relationship to God. Despite seeing all that he has seen of Christ and learning all that he has learned of God, Philip yet fails to find peace for his soul. And I wonder, can any of us relate? Even for those of us who have been walking with Jesus for quite a long time, when we survey our world outside of the walls of this beautiful sanctuary, when we survey our country, our city, and our neighborhoods, as we watch war ravage the sanctity of life across the globe, as the world gets hotter and hotter, as the gap between the rich and poor continues to stretch toward the breaking point, isn't it sometimes hard to make sense of God's promises? As gun violence locks us into cycles of traumatic shock, who can relate to Philip wanting to see God? As state governors use legislation to lock our children away from the truth of history and the promise of better futures, can any of us relate to one not too proud to say, Lord, I'm with you, but please make it make sense? We should recall that this is the same Philip who when asked by Jesus in John chapter 6 where to buy bread for more than 5,000 hungry people, replied not, here's where you get bread, but we ain't got enough money, Lord. This was an earlier moment of Philip failing to understand what Jesus was about. Jesus didn't ask how much money was had or was needed. He asked where to get what the poor needed. But Philip, perhaps like many of us, was so distracted by the overwhelming nature of need that he failed to give himself fully to the miraculous power of simply trying to serve and provide. Philip fails to understand what Jesus is asking about food for the hungry. And he fails here in our passage in understanding the relationship between God and Christ. But what happens inside of Philip's failure is the gift for us. You see, in the moments in which God doesn't make sense, when faith seems feeble, when our hope struggles to break forth from the hopelessness of this world, Philip is a reminder that we need not be perfect to receive and experience God's grace. How many of you are thankful for that? We need not be perfect to experience God's grace. In fact, the only prerequisite 
for receiving God's grace is that we embrace the fact of our imperfection. The fact that we all stand every single day as we live and breathe in need of salvation, of forgiveness, of deliverance, my God, even of power and strength that we cannot summon ourselves. And Philip is a reminder, if we dare hear it, that when we are weakest, God truly is strongest. In this society of ours where we seem every day to be losing our capacity to bear what we don't know and don't understand, Philip reminds us that God doesn't call us to know and, every, and understand everything, but to be real and honest and truthful, even and especially when our voices tremble with trepidation and our questions reveal what we failed to grasp about who Christ is. The witness of Philip's life reminds us that when we faithfully embrace our failure, we crack open the possibility of God doing something that there is no way we can do for ourselves. Philip family is a reminder that when we embrace the fact that we are not as strong as so social media wants us to pretend to be, we are not as holy or sanctified as decades of church attendance might sometimes make us feel. We are at our very best failures saved by the grace of God. And here is the gift inside of Philip's failure. Philip asked the question, Jesus, why won't you just let us see God? And in the brokenness of that question, a question that would sound silly to almost anyone who's seasoned at Bible study, we receive through Christ, thanks to the faithful failure of Philip, a teaching about who Christ is and who God is in relation to Christ that we could not have received otherwise. Thanks to the bravery of Philip's faithful failure, we learned that when we see Christ, we've seen everything we need to see. If you've encountered Jesus in a small moment of your life, you've seen everything you need to see. If you know that there was one moment in your life where Jesus is the reason you made it to the other side, Philip's failure gives us the gift that we have now seen everything that we need to see. And if you need a reminder, if you're sitting under the sound of my voice this morning, then that means that God got you out of bed. And if God got you out of bed, that means God did something that you could not have done for yourself. And if you know God like I know God, that is a reason to give thanks for the Philip who reminds us that even in moments when we cannot do it ourselves, we are met by a God who loves us, who keeps us, and who calls us God's own. Family, embrace your failure faithfully because God is all up in it. Amen.